everyone. It's Eric Coins from Flywheel Studio here. I want to talk today about information security and have some of the things that we think about a lot, but also things that are you know in the development world, building applications, and some things that you as a developer or as a client should be aware of. So first things first, information security, data protection, how we secure users' data, the applications is an incredibly hairy topic. And there's really one big reason behind this. Nobody really knows everything there is to know about this, and there's no right answer. So I wanna kind of talk about first, a little bit of thought and theory before we go into this. And then I wanna give a little bit of insight and information in terms of the practice of this. First, I wanna start with kind of a general exercise. Let's say that you have a 10 digit or maybe it's 100 digits, numbers, letters, special characters that if somebody found that out, they could end the entire world. How would you protect that? Some of you might say I would put it on a sheet of paper and I would put it in a safe. Some of you would say, no, that's too dangerous. Somebody can break into the safe. I would have to memorize it. Some of you might say the paper's not safe and I would put it on, I'd write it in stone because the paper could disintegrate um, or something could happen like that. On, and the, one of the points here is first, everyone's gonna have a different opinion on how to protect this. Somebody is going to say, look, the safe is the safest way to protect this. And that's what we need. Somebody says, you have to put guards around the safe. You have to have the army protect it. And you can't protect it yourself. You need uh, five people to open the safe because it's so important. And then somebody else is going to say, look, the only person I trust to know this is me. And I want to be the only one who knows this. Almost no one is going to say that you'd store this information online or on a computer, and that's the safest place for it, which is kind of interesting. So you know, there's going to be a big difference in how people want to protect this, even though everyone knows it you know, has the same idea of what it is and the consequences of it being leaked. And also, to some extent, nobody would put that very sensitive information online. Secondly, though, what if you are going to the grocery store and you want to tell your friends about it? Well, most people would readily put that online, and we do that every day on social media applications. We post status updates, and sometimes in some scenarios, we choose for some of that information to be private. For instance, pictures on Facebook and Facebook accounts. Most people today have some permissions about who can view what information there and who can read certain things that you're posting. Some people don't. Everyone has a different opinion about the information that they're posting and how that should be treated. We have things like emails, though, where we would expect a higher level of privacy. We'd expect that nobody but the recipient should be able to read that email. And what I'm getting at here is there's also a lot of different types of data with different levels of protection. And we treat that data differently, and some people would choose to treat it differently. Quite often what this is called in the industry is data classification. And what we can look at here is I just have a diagram that has some examples, okay? So, for instance, public data. Well, we could say that, you know, a, an upcoming concert is public data, right? Every You'd, you'd post that publicly. Um, you know, things like research reports that um, people are not paying for are public data by default. And um, if you post something online, like a blog that you expect people to read, it becomes public data. And that's something that's meant for public consumption. Now, on the flip side, you might have internal data. So that could be, um, for instance, my meeting minutes for my company meeting. It's something I would not want to be pub. I would not personally publish that online. If it was published, though, it wouldn't. There wouldn't really be a negative effect. There's nothing so classified in there that if somebody had those meeting minutes, that I would feel um, threatened or uh, that th that it that it shouldn't be there. I just wouldn't personally do that. Was there's no point in making that public. 
And you can see that this information gets uh, more and more critical. So for instance, your social security number or your national ID number might be captured as private data or as critical data. You know, it's kind of interesting, at least in this example, they've rated biometric data, not as the most critical data. So you know, when you look at some of these other things, infrastructure and system configurations is more critical than biometric data. It's kind of important to think about it this way too, because one thing that people often default to is just make everything as secure as possible. But as we kind of saw in that, you know, 100 digit number example, that doesn't really work. If you don't want, if you would say that the internet's not secure enough for that information, then if you default everything to the most, the highest level of security, then to some degree, we wouldn't use the internet at all. And we wouldn't have online applications. And there's a cost to this. There is a very real cost to um, encrypting all of your data and you know, not having access to any of it, even through your own backend. And siloing data between organizations increase the co complexity and the cost of running an application. There's, there are trade-offs to adding more layers of restrictions and security. Just what, there's pros and cons. Typically what we do when we're building an application is we go through the process of, of classifying the data that we're working with and ensuring that that data is secured appropriately. Here are some general best practices that we look at, and this is broadly general. Every application is different, and so use cases can vary. We almost never expose any personal identifiers, and we make sure that data is siloed within the application so it's only visible by the, the user themselves and potentially administrators. Versus information like usernames and profile pictures, that becomes more like internal data where anyone can see it if they have access to the application because you would expect to see some information about users and their profiles if you're using the application. If a user provides a social security number though, or banking information, we treat that even higher than private data, even higher than the user's phone number and email address. To a large extent, if you really wanted to find somebody's email address, you probably could. You can go to their LinkedIn, you could uh, find that on other websites, and a lot of that information is public at the end of the day through different search engines. On the flip side though, we would never wanna be responsible for having the user social security number or the potential to leak that. So in general, we avoid storing it at all costs, but if we need to, we might encrypt that field in our database. So it's not even accessible to administrators and other users. So it's only usable for the people in the application that actually do genuinely need to use that information. Things like messages between users though, might be more at a confidential level, and we might have different um, security parameters to protect these. A lot of what we do, and I'll come to this in a little bit, is we're using the industry best practices to protect data, and we look at what would the cost be to protect this data, and then what are the trade-offs, and what would happen if this data was publicly leaked? I wanna show a diagram here, and this is very, very simple. Okay, and this is a SUPA-based diagram kind of showing um, the front end, the API layer, and SUPA-based. It, it is, holds across Flutterflow, SUPA-based, WeWeb, SUPA-based, and even to some extent, you can replace SUPA-based with Firebase in this example. We would almost never consider the front end of an application secure. For developers, this is common knowledge. If you're not a developer and you are a client, Anything that's in the front end is accessible in terms of the code base for the end user. So they can look at the API keys, they can see the code, they can see what API calls are made, and they could actually choose to make those API calls themselves without using the application. And we see this in penetration testing and hacking at the end of the day. The front end because of that decision and that knowledge, and again, this is just an industry best practice, 
all of the decisions and functionality and features that matter to an application or that are critical, we perform those on the back end, which is kind of behind this scene here. And that is denoted by Supabase, but that could be GCP, it could be AWS or Azure or any other system. The front end and the back end communicate through an API layer. And so basically the front end, whether that's Flutterflow or WeWeb is, is calling to the back end and asking for data and the back end is choosing to provide that data. In an application, you have something called authentication. This is how the user signs into the application. Usually, most applications use email and password. Quite often in consumer apps today, we're using phone number um, and SMS OTP. Uh, you can use magic link. Um, you can also choose to use um, like a two-factor authentication after password to double verify the user. Regardless, what happens is that user, once that information goes to the backend, the backend says, is this correct? If it is, we'll give you a token. It's called the JWT token, JWT, um, a JSON web token. And that is like a key to receive information from the database. It says, I know who this person is. I trust them. I will provide them with data. Now, what data should you provide that person with? It depends on the person, right? If you look at a large company, some people, administrators, the C-suite or leadership probably have access to more information than somebody who might be an hourly worker, maybe a cleaner or an admin clerk. We protect information by the person who needs to see it and based on a, kind of a need to know basis. That's where row level security comes in. Row level security is a filter on data coming in and out of the database and verifying what the end user should be getting. Let's take an example. Let's say I have a social media app and I am an end user. So I have an account on that application. I log in and I want to see all of my user information. It's my information. I should be able to see it in the API layer and row level security if the rules are written that way agrees with me and will provide me all that information. What if I ask for your information though? As an end user, I probably shouldn't be able to receive that. But actually, if you are a developer, you could make that request. What will happen is from the front end, you make that request. It goes to row level security and row level security says that does not check out. That person should not be receiving that information. We're not going to send it. It's like a bodyguard or a bouncer for a club, making sure that what goes in and out is correct. Now, let's say you switch my role to be an administrator. You could say, okay, I'm trying to see a list of all users active today. And role level security says, yep, Eric is an administrator. He should be able to see this. Supervase provides that information and it comes back to me. Now, maybe I want to look, maybe if I'm an end user and I want to look at profiles of my friends, I go in, I go and I say to row level security, hey, I'm trying to view my friend's profiles. The security rules look at that and say, yeah, you should be able to do that. You're an authenticated user and you should be able to see profiles of your friends, username, photo, what other information that person has made public. And then Supervase provides that information, it comes back. Now, again, all of these API calls are being made in public. Anyone can actually go see this information if they know where to look. And so what if I'm not a user? I can still make that API call, but what will happen is row level security, again, if properly configured, would say, you're not authenticated, you're not a user of our application, I don't wanna give you that information and Supabase would not return anything. This is how we secure the majority of our applications in one of the key components of that information security. It's the row level security policies. Now, uh, Firebase has something very similar. It's Firebase security rules. And again, we go write those and we, and we publish those over 
the database, Firestore, and that's a set of rules that limit what information can go in and out of the application to make sure that people are only seeing the information that they should be seeing. Now, information security goes a long way beyond this. This is a diagram of the application itself, but Supabase is an application that you could log into. And so I have a username and password for my accounts and you as the client or you as a developer would have a password and email from your accounts. If somebody got access to that, they would be able to log directly into Supabase or Firebase or any backend platform without needing and basically bypassing low level security because this is a system that they're logging into. So again, information security shows up in another direction, and that's protecting your personal products, um, your personal uh, devices, and making sure that all of your accounts are secure. This is where two-factor authentication becomes very popular, making sure that you have that turned on for your email as well as your accounts like Supabase. We also make sure that we protect access to uh, products like Flutterflow and WeWeb and that our, our access there is secure because people could go in there and make changes to an application um, and or have access to uh, the back end through those other applications. We have to look at all of the points of entry when we're looking at information security and it's quite extensive. One, I, one simple way would be to uh, fish an email address, sending a um, a malicious link to a user and getting them to click on it. Another way would be um, to steal somebody's laptop and have access to their information then. Then it comes down to, was your device encrypted? Do you have a secure password on your physical device? Not even for the Supabase or WeWeb or Flutterflow account. How strong are your passwords? This is the difficult part about information security that I mentioned in the beginning of this video is it is a hairy topic because there's so much that you can do. And at the end of the day, it might not be enough. We just saw recently multiple organizations, including Fidelity Group, have hacking incidents. 100% Fidelity does everything they can to protect users' data. They have hundreds of thousands of employees who are actively participating in information security training. They have what I would consider a world-class information security team with um, the ability for um, people to white hack their applications and receive bounties. They have all the things that you would expect in place and they're still not able to always secure data. It's just a reality of the world we live in and that we have to be extremely careful with the data we choose to protect. Closing this out, I wanna talk about just a few things that are really critical and important. The first one is don't store data you don't need. If you don't need social security numbers, don't ask for it. If you don't need emails or addresses or user pictures or banking information, don't store that information. It's better to not take the liability and it's less information for you to protect. Secondly, we often lean on our partners to store critical information that we would prefer not to store ourselves, to be honest. That's why we use Stripe for payments and Plaid for banking connections. Plaid has a world-class data, uh, data and information security team. It's not to say that we don't, but they are actively investing significantly more money in protecting those users' data than we are. They're also more uh, able to back up the liability of storing that data. And it also gives users a peace of mind knowing that they're going with a well-known and trusted organization to store that data and not a startup. So we lean on partners to store some critical information where we need to use it. Lastly, information is only secure as you let it be and as you make it. A lot of this comes down to a few things. Have you spent the time, energy, and budget to secure your information? Have you taken those protocols seriously and added two-factor authentication and secured your own personal devices? Third, don't be afraid to challenge and audit your own systems. Flywheel pays for a penetration test or basically a hacking session for every application that goes live, and that's performed by an independent third party. 
that's the only way that we feel comfortable that we've done the right thing every time because we're not actually the ones who are certifying it. There's another group who's an expert in hacking and securing uh, data and information, and we let them handle that. There's a lot to take away and a lot to learn, but if you have any questions, just reach out and we'd be happy to help you at Flywheel Studio.